The world's fastest graphics card is here, and we've got two of them. I think the combined value of both of these has got to be less now. I think the combined value of these two GPUs is nearing £5,000, which is absolutely insane. I mean, who needs this much horsepower? Gamers? Creative professionals? Very PC-centric YouTubers? RG have already told me this is a loner sample. In this video, we're going to be answering that exact question. We're going to be looking at some benchmarks to see exactly how these things perform, whether we can actually finally crush 4K 120Hz gaming across the board, and I guess almost giving NVIDIA a little bit of a good grilling. Because I think everyone's asking the same question. Why? Why do these exist? Find out after a short word from this video's sponsor. Signal RGB is the quick and easy way to synchronize all of your RGB devices together. Use one application to combine different branded PC components, peripherals, and even Philips Hue, all into a single cohesive color scheme. Different brands, different themes, one free app. You can even sync your RGB with the games themselves, the ultimate immersive experience. Get started with Signal RGB today with that link down below. So yes, we have two RTX 3090 Ti's in front of us, and we are going to unbox both. We're going to start with a palette. This is their game rock that has come a very long way to be here today. This is going to be a little bit of a different comparison, actually, because the two cards we have in front of us, while they are the same, they're also very different, because this is very much a traditional air-cooled card. It's going to have three different fans on it. I imagine it will look very similar to this one. I mean, it's definitely not a conventional design. They've gone for the whole, what's the most polite way of saying this? Out there design, as this one is all about the bling, and it is very much Marmite, love it or hate it. For me, I think the crystal structure is a little bit much, but if you have this in a more traditional GPU orientation, then it's actually a pretty nice looking GPU. And of course, you get the lighting coming down from the bottom. It looks pretty neat. Oh, okay, that's different. I'd heard about this, but this is the first time I've actually seen one. Take a look at this. We have another new power connector. This time it's a 16 pin. And let me get the absolutely crazy bonkers thing out of the way now. This is an absolutely insane power hungry graphics card that consumes 450 watts of power. 450! You thought the RTX 3090 was bad with 350? This is just taking it to a whole new level. I wouldn't usually talk about gas and electric prices in a video because frankly it's pretty boring. We all know at the moment that prices of that are absolutely through the roof and suddenly getting a 450 watt graphics card is not only gonna cost you a load of money now, but also into the foreseeable future. Personally speaking, I'm actually quite glad that they're bringing in this new connector. In the short term, it definitely is gonna cause you some pain. You're gonna have to use adapters like this. It's even more of an alien now. You've got three eight pins and you do need to connect them all. But in the long term, I believe it's a more efficient way of actually delivering power. You don't need to take up as much of the PCB and the end result should be one cable on your computer rather than three. But obviously in this case, you're gonna have to get an adapter while you wait for someone like CableMod to actually supply you a different cable that can look a whole lot better. No pain, no gain. You do also have NVLink though, if you want two of these. If you really do wanna spend close to 5,000 pounds on graphics, it's possible. It looks so funny, doesn't it? The ASUS Strix card, however, takes a very different approach because they've realized that 450 watts of power is a lot. And in order to actually dissipate all of that heat, you're gonna need a pretty hefty solution. But rather than relying on just the power of air, okay, I didn't realize that, it's a 240, it's actually an all-in-one, as well as a fan on the graphics card as well. So you still have three fans, just in a very different orientation. As with the palette, you also get one of these same, it looks like NVIDIA manufacture these maybe, because it's exactly the same power connection. Splitter type thing, alien. But at least you're getting more for your money. Might not translate into more performance, but you get more stuff. So while this is definitely different in terms of its cooling approach, when it comes to aesthetics, this is pretty much business as usual when it comes to ROG. I think this is an absolutely fantastic looking card. It's very well built, even though it is a tad plasticky. You've got even more display outputs on the back actually. Here you've got three display ports and two HDMI. Whereas I think on this one, you just have three display ports and one HDMI. So quite a significant difference. You've got a performance mode and a quiet mode, but let's be honest, you're probably always gonna use the performance mode. You've got two fan headers on the side of the card, which is brilliant because, well, any extra configuring, your front case fans can then be dictated by your GPU performance rather than your CPU. And then of course, you've got that 16 pin 
on the top for your power. It's almost masking the fact that this is about to use 450 watts of juice. But all of the power and RGB lighting actually comes out from the graphics card itself. So you don't need to plug this into the motherboard and all the fans are pre-fitted and pre-routed for your convenience. Here we have a 3070 Ti. And then as for the Strix, it is pretty big. Make no mistake, it is pretty big, but it's not the biggest I've seen. I imagine if you get like a MSI Supreme version, then that will be absolutely gigantic. And there'd be plenty of cases that that won't fit in. But then again, if you're using a 240 AIO, then the same applies to this, just in a slightly different way. I'm just looking in the box and it looks as if there is a slight missed opportunity. You don't get four additional screws for mounting extra fans to this. It'll be fine, don't worry. I'm just stress testing. I'm stress testing me, the cards, the ASUS PR, and I think everyone watching. <laughs> God, I really need to behave, don't I? But enough talk, let's actually get these installed. And the main question that you probably have is how different is this to say like a RTX 3090? And ultimately, what can this graphics card do? Well, in terms of value for money, it certainly can't be a more traditional graphics card because this 3070 Ti is gonna cost you around about 550 pounds and there is no way you're getting four times the performance out of one of these. The Founders Edition of the 3090 Ti costs, I think it's £1,849. And let's be honest, at launch, the chance of you actually getting one of those for that price is very unlikely. And while I don't have current pricing at the moment, as soon as I have it in the edit, I'll add it. But these two graphics cards, they will be a lot more, especially the Strix version. Budget graphics cards, these are not. It should go without saying that you are going to need a pretty beefy power supply to actually get this to work. NVIDIA recommends an 850 watt or larger, but I think unless you've got a 1000 watt power supply, it's a little bit too close for comfort, especially with the AIO versions that are probably gonna, well, require even more juice. I meant to say AIB, which is add in board partners, but actually that works because there's a AIO card as well. I should say as well that there is actually a dual BIOS on this palette card. I can see the little switch. Oh yeah, that looks great, doesn't it? That's a really nice, really nice look that we've got going on there. I mean, there's just no way to make this look good, is there? Other than replacing the cable. Grab ourselves a 4K monitor, because if you're using anything less, even like 1440p ultra wide, this is overkill. This is aimed at 8K gaming. 8K gaming with DLSS, but still 8K gaming nonetheless. Moment of truth. That is a very bright graphics card. Can you see what I mean though? Even if you don't like the crazy outrageous design of the side of the card, as soon as you put it in your system in a more normal orientation, I think it looks great. I guess the only downside to that is that if you do want to properly show off the bling, then you'd need to put it in a vertical GPU mount. I think that much is obvious. That's interesting. That makes no sense. Oh, that's not good. Have I actually got a card that's dead? Oh my word, oh my word. That's not good. That's not good at all. And before you say, falling over on the side, that would not kill the graphics card. No, no, bad. Oh, maybe it wasn't plugged in. <gasps> maybe where I screwed it in, it like pushed it out of the socket a bit. Oh. Oh, <laughs> I was covering it up. It was all a lie. I was so stressed. I was about to cry. Oh, relieved now. Woo! <laughs> I think the best game to test is gonna be some Cyberpunk 2077, so we will fire that up. But while we're doing so, there is something very important you need to understand about the 3090 Ti, and that is that it's got a little bit of a marketing identity crisis, because this is an RTX gaming graphics card, but it's not really just for gaming, if for gaming at all, because while it is gonna be the fastest graphics card you can get for playing games, the main thing really with this is that it's actually for creative professionals, because this has got 24 gigabytes of memory. It's GDDR6X, and it's actually changed this time around, because unlike on the 3090, you've now got 12 little memory chiplets of two gigabytes rather than 24 of one, and in practical terms, that has meant that the memory is now even faster. You have memory bandwidth over one terabyte a second. One terabyte. And that's pretty crazy, but for gaming, that's not really gonna translate into more performance. This is a graphics card that's all about things like Blender or anything really for creative workloads that requires a lot of memory, but you don't require like the professional software and need a Quadro card. So this is either a really expensive graphics card 
or it could be a cheap quadro, depending on how you look at it. However, with all of that said, there is actually a much bigger overarching problem that I do have with this graphics card. Not only this one, but the Strix one as well. But I'll talk to you about that at the end of the video, because that requires a few sentences. And I don't want to give the game away now. Where's the fun in that? Right, let's max this baby out. We're going to turn this up to Psycho. I wouldn't normally do that. Clues in the name. Psycho. But this gaming graphics card probably costs over £2,000. So if this can't do it, well, literally nothing can. Let's run the benchmark. What are we going to get? What are we going to get? In terms of frame rate, oh, OK. Psycho, 36 frames a second at 4K, DLSS quality, Psycho. I'm not saying anything, but I will look at the power usage, which is currently 644 watts of power. You do get slightly more CUDA cores, it's not actually that many, it's around about 300-ish more, but the base clock and the boost clock of this is better, and the fact that you can actually pump more power into this means that you should be able to push it further and get even higher frames per second. But obviously does that count if you're using 450 watts of power? That one's on you. Let's go to the more NVIDIA friendly settings of Ray Tracing Ultra. I mean I'm a bit disappointed, the frame rate hasn't really done much. Like I know this is really hard, but that is precisely the point. This is meant to be the world's best graphics card, and it's come up against one of the hardest games to actually drive, and it's fallen a little bit flat. I think we're far up the game for real, but I want to see what the thermals are going to be like in a real world situation with the side panel on. Well, in the game for real, it definitely feels very smooth. We're getting around about 60 FPS now, which is a pretty decent improvement. It is going to depend where and when you are in the game. Obviously, you're putting the Tensor Cores to good use, the RT Cores. It's probably the best looking title thing you can get with everything turned up. And you just can't really do that on any graphics card. So I love the fact that you can here. But if you're running this on an RTX 3080, would you really be able to notice such a big difference if you just turn the ray tracing down slightly and got more or less the same frame rate? I'm not convinced. But I guess the proof is in the pudding. This is the hardest test, really, that we can throw at it, other than Psycho. And it is passing now with flying Colors. They must have made some decent changes to the card actually, because in terms of noise levels, like you can definitely hear it, but it's not really a problem. I don't know how many non-professional Apex Legends players are probably going to grab themselves an RTX 3090, but it is interesting to see nonetheless. Yeah, look, around about 160, 170 FPS, so you're probably getting the most out of this display, there's no doubt about that. But you would have to really like Apex for this to make sense. Let's have a look at our clock speeds though, again in Cyberpunk 2077, and you can see that the default hovers around about 2055, it does go to 2070 sometimes. I mean, I don't think Palette are necessarily pushing this as the absolute fastest one you can buy, spend everything that you have, and you can get like an ounce more performance. The eagle-eyed viewers amongst you have probably already noticed this, but in terms of the board power, we are using not 450 watts, about 380. I sort of went into this expecting the Palette card to be pretty cool, but not necessarily the one that I'd buy. But I mean, I think it looks brilliant. It's almost certainly going to be a lot cheaper than the Strix card. If you're looking at this card and you seriously want to buy a 3090, highly recommend it. But again, should you get a 3090? We'll talk about that a little bit later. Okay, I think we've seen enough. I know what you want to see now. Something a little bit more... Strixy. Hmm... Might have to do it a little bit hacky, but I think it can be done. Well, that's the best I'm going to be able to do. Definitely do take this system then with a slight pinch of salt. But bear in mind that this 4000D is not really sufficient unless you've not got a radiator at the front. Let's do this. I'm not sure what I think of it look wise, to be honest with you, because I'd say I like it, but there's so much stuff going on. And the graphics card itself is quite understated until you see the underside. That would look fantastic in a vertical GPU mount but I'd wager most people aren't going to do that. But I'd say compared to like the normal Strix card, it doesn't look quite as good. However, looks definitely aren't everything, as I prove week in, week out. Because obviously having an all-in-one liquid cooler attached to your GPU means that you're gonna get great thermals, more performance, and I think the most important thing for me, much lower noise levels, at least in theory. I think the game that most of you really wanna see is some Warzone, and you can use this to compare it to your current setup, I guess. This is running at absolute max settings, but this time DLSS is set to quality. And yeah, this is definitely a cake and eat it situation. If you want the fastest card out there and you want to be able to do everything, I think this really shows exactly what you can get. Around about 130 FPS at 4K. So all of that detail is available here, combined with all of the frame rate. 
This is the absolute dream. Oh, 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 that's not the dream. I've only got a pistol. I've only got a bloody pistol. Ow, oh, no. I'll have you know, it is very hard to actually play this game when you can't really see the monitors. No excuses, no excuses. See, he's done it. But let's have a look at those clock speeds, shall we? I mean, I guess this makes sense. They're not gonna overclock it too much out of the box because they do want it to be as stable as possible. But I guess I did expect to see nearer the 2100 mark. Because if you look at those thermals, we're only getting around about 54 degrees. So in terms of thermals, there definitely is a lot of overclocking headroom in this. This is a case of whether the rest of the card can actually keep up. How are we doing in terms of power, by the way? 583 watts. And the board is actually draining 370 of those. I'm a little bit surprised. I just expected this to be a little bit more boom in your face. But it's not. It's also not as quiet as I would like as well. I will say that you can obviously tune these fans a little bit more. You'll get higher temperatures, but obviously you'll get lower noise levels. But I'd say that's about the same. If not, maybe slightly louder because the noise is coming from the top of the case rather than behind the tempered glass. But we're not going to leave this at stock. You didn't honestly think I was going to get a Strix card in this PC, make a right mess of it like I did. I'll leave it there. 100 to the boost clock. Crank that power all the way up, add 50 on the voltage, 80 on the memory. I got an achievement for risking my hardware there. <laughs> That's dangerous. Straight away, our GPU clock has rocketed up by around about 100 to 2160. But obviously in terms of stability, you don't really know until you've played a game like this for around about an hour or so. And even then you can still get some weird issues pop up that you just don't expect. Can we add some more? 2,220 megahertz on an RTX 3090 Ti. Oh, and it's died. So maybe if you gave it a little bit more voltage, then you'd be able to get this stable, but there's not gonna be like a absolutely huge amount of overclocking that you can do with this. So do be aware. The best way of looking at it is that this is clearly not really a gaming graphics card, even though it kind of is. If you've got a stupid amount of money, then you probably wouldn't be watching this video anyway. You would have already bought this thing. And then for everybody else, well, you should know that there isn't really any value here, unless you're going to be using this for any sort of application that needs the 24 gig of memory. You can expense this on your company and clearly it's gonna make you money so your sense of value is going to be very different to someone like myself that wouldn't utilize all of this horsepower. However, the big elephant in the room and the thing I really want to address is the fact that this has a very limited shelf life. We're at the end of the 30 series with new graphics cards coming almost certainly at the end of the year, if not very shortly into the next. And I think the chances of the RTX 3090 Ti being the fastest graphics card in 2023 just is very unlikely. The chances of buyer's remorse with this is pretty high. You went out and you lost me money. RTX 3090 Ti, you're fired. Let me know your thoughts on the RTX 3090 Ti down in the comment section below. Is this something that you actually are considering picking up? If you've enjoyed this video though, smash the like button, get yourself subscribed. And as always, if you do wanna check out current pricing on anything in this rig, including the RTX 3090 Ti, then you can find my Amazon affiliate links listed down below. I'll catch you in the next one.